Welcome to God's people here in uh, Idlewild, California, worshiping uh, the living God. Uh, It's been an unusual few days for us in that we have received the initial portion of two or three feet of snow that is forecast, and it may be even more than that. Well, as the snow began to fall yesterday, it was accompanied by, well, what for us was significant howling winds and low temperatures. And I know if you grew up in the Midwest, you're just thinking, well, okay, uh, was it 70 miles an hour wind? Uh, Were the temperatures below zero? Well, maybe not. But that reminds me of stories that I've heard of those kind of storms in the Midwest where the winds and the snow were so blinding Uh, that visibility plummeted to zero. You couldn't literally see your hand in front of your face in that kind of storm. Well, when farmers knew that kind of storm was coming, they would tie a rope in between the back porch um, door and, and the barn. And in the middle of the storm, when they felt they needed to check on the livestock, they would grasp that rope, and it was like a lifeline. And there was more than one farmer who died if, for whatever reason, they let go of the rope or the rope became uh, unsecured. I say all of that because worship is very much like that rope that we need to secure firmly between our hearts and the heart of God. So we need to find that place in our interior uh, to which we can firmly tie the truths of God's word that we're going to hear in this worship service and the songs that we sing so that they might uh, allow us to make it into the presence of God. So let's go together uh, to worship the living God. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Ha! Ah. 
Let us pray. Dear Lord our God, we come to you with gratitude and praise. Thank you for answers to our prayers. We are so grateful for our thrift shop volunteers and for the blessings this ministry brings to our community and missionaries around the world. This week, we lift up ministries in Ghana, Liberia, and a Syrian outreach in San Diego. We thank you for the volunteers you provided and pray you will bring more volunteers. We continue to pray for those overseeing and working at the thrift shop. Lord, we thank you for the rain and snow you've brought this winter. We pray you will provide warmth and safe travels for our residents and snow removal crews. A newborn great-granddaughter was in ICU with breathing issues. She was released from the hospital last week. We praise you. A friend who was in Russia for several weeks is traveling home now. We praise you and pray for protection and safe travels. Lord, we praise you for sending your son to us and the sacrifice he made so our relationship with you could be restored. We lift up these prayers before you. The friend of a regular visitor will have surgery this week and then rehab. We pray for spiritual and physical healing and that you would pr provide peace and opportunities for hope. A regular attender and thrift shop volunteer is going to Arizona. We pray for safe travels, that she is helpful in preparing her family members for a move. A daughter lost her mother-in-law. We pray for peace and comfort on her, the families, and friends. The daughter of a member has been suffering from pain in her side and back for several months. She had a biopsy and is scheduled to see doctors this week. We pray for wisdom for the doctors and you as the great physician to bring relief, healing, and wholeness. A member just had hip fusion surgery. We pray the procedure was successful for safe uh, travels home and a swift, complete recovery. A member threw out her back recently. We pray the pain is subsiding and that you as the great physician will bring healing, wholeness, and restoration to full health. A member will have reverse shoulder replacement surgery in April. We pray for a successful procedure, healing for her other arm, and a return to full mobility, strength, and health. The cousin of a member has a brain tumor. She had a seizure a few months ago and had brain surgery. She has been given several months to live. We pray for peace and comfort on her, her family, and friends. Several members are fighting cancer. We pray for the cancers to be eradicated. We pray for you as the great physician to bring healing and restoration. We lift up the country of Ukraine. We pray for the hostilities between Russia and Ukraine to end as soon as possible and for a lasting peace to be negotiated. We praise you for countries, churches, organizations, and missionaries who are assisting the refugees. We lift up the local art school. We pray for the seniors to have successful college additions and safe travels. We pray for more students, faculty, and staff to draw near to you, to know you and love you more deeply. We thank you for the families and members that attend our church and pray for additional families and new members to join our congregation. We lift up this nation and its leaders. We pray for you to raise up leaders who have the wisdom, desire, faith, and courage to guide this nation according to your will, returning us to living by the principles upon which this country was founded with you at the center. We praise you for the revival in Kentucky and we pray for that revival to spread. We pray for friends and family who do not yet know your son to be drawn nearer and near to you, claiming Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we may love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind. May we continue to trust in you. We pause now for silent prayer. And we close this time of prayer 
by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but the sanctuary in which we worship, it's so meaningful to so many because it's the place where some very profound events occur. It might have been a funeral, might have been a, a wedding, uh, or a real connection with God in prayer, or hearing His Word, or just a song that just moves you from the, the, just the darkness of the circumstances where you find yourself. Well, this sanctuary was never designed for anyone to live here permanently. You look around, you don't see any showers, no laundry room. I don't see any beds or kitchen tables or, or stoves. The, the furniture that we do have in the sanctuary, it, it screams out important but temporary. And so if I brought furniture from my living room and set it up here on, on the platform, uh, at best it would look just like a prop that people would expect I use it for one message during a week and then by the next week it better be gone. So there's temporary versus permanent. One of the last things Jesus would do in his earthly ministry was to instruct two of his disciples to go into the city of Jerusalem and when they saw a man carrying a pitcher of water, they were to follow him to the house and ask the owner of the house, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. So Jesus celebrated the Lord's Supper with his disciples in an upper room that by definition was a guest room. And guest rooms, like sanctuaries, are meant to just be temporary. Not only would they have the last supper in that temporary abode, but in that same place, some 50 uh, days later, the Holy Spirit would be poured out on those same disciples on the day of Pentecost. And so it's in this guest room the disciples would be empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach Jesus so boldly that thousands of people would come to faith a at a shot. So world-changing, history-making events, they happen in temporary quarters. Every single disciple in that upper room was just a temporary guest. Some of Jesus' final words that he spoke in the upper room uh, jolted his disciples with the news that he was going to be temporary, his presence, that he was leaving. In John chapter 16, a, a portion that we call the upper room discourse, uh, Jesus said this, I am going to the Father who sent me, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And just a few moments before Jesus informs his disciples that his presence was going to be temporary among them, he said this in John chapter 14, beginning with verse 15, which is our main scripture today. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be with you. So Jesus is telling his disciples at this, in the upper room at the Last Supper that the Father is sending another advocate. I'm temporary. He's going to be forever. All right, he's not coming as a guest, but as a permanent resident in your life. He will be in you and he'll be with you forever. And so it's the intention of Jesus and his Father that the Holy Spirit should live inside of us, uh, not as a guest, but as a permanent resident, to be at home in us in the deepest sense. 
Now, if I invite you to my house as to be a guest in my home, uh, there are certain rooms and there are certain household items that will just simply be off limits. You won't see them. You won't see the laundry room. The doors will be closed. Uh, most of the closets will be closed, shut. You won't be able to see what's in there. I'm going to close the doors to the bedroom. You won't see that. You won't know where the plunger is. I'm going to hide that too. But if you are a permanent resident of my household, you have complete and full access to every room and you know exactly where things like the plunger is kept. So here's the point. If you treat the Holy Spirit like a temporary guest in your life, there's going to be areas that you will let him know, hey, these are off limits to you. Holy Spirit, I don't want you, you know, traipsing around in, in this set of habits or in that relationship or in this pattern of words that I use on occasion or in certain ways that I spend my money or certain ways that I treat my spouse. And I don't want you looking over my shoulder when I'm viewing some stuff on the Internet. I'm going to keep all of that in a secret room locked away. I've got some unforgiveness. I've got some bitterness that I've got locked into a closet. I don't want you to go there because I want to, on occasion, just go into that closet and just stroke that bitterness and unforgiveness, and I want to nurse it. I don't want you, Holy Spirit, because you are a temporary guest in my house, to see what I do with my checkbook or my credit card statements. Um, Holy Spirit, you're just not invited to those areas. And of course, it's okay for you to come with me to church. I, I mean, I'm going to show you the nicest. I'm showing everybody the nicest rooms of my house, the cleanest rooms of my house when I go there. But the other places, I don't want you. Now, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. And he's not going to barge into areas of your life where he's not been invited. So here's the question of this message. Do you, do I, do we treat the Holy Spirit as a guest who is temporary or as a resident who is permanent? It might help me to give the Holy Spirit full permanent access to my life if I simply knew him better, if I knew what he was like. But here's one of the challenges to that. The Holy Spirit doesn't take very many selfies. Okay, on my phone, I looked at it. I've got over 5,000 pictures. I've got over 600 videos on my phone. And I am in very few of those pictures or videos because I just love to take pictures of the family. But selfies, I'm not really into that. And the Holy Spirit's not really into selfies either. The Holy Spirit loves portraits of Jesus in you. And the Holy Spirit passionately works to see Jesus formed in you. And so in the Scriptures, while we've got all kinds of pictures of Jesus, we don't have nearly as many of His Holy Spirit. But in the upper room, Jesus pulls out a few snapshots of the Holy Spirit and he shows them to us. He tells us what the Holy Spirit is like. And if we knew what the Holy Spirit was like, we might be more um, accommodating to say, you're going to go from temporary to permanent status. You're no longer a guest. You are a permanent resident in my life. Because the Spirit is a who, not an it. Jesus said in Luke 14, I'm going to send another advocate that he may be with you forever. That personal pronoun, um, it says that the Holy Spirit is not a force like gravity. He's a person. And he's come to, to help me in the ups and downs of my life. He's sent to help me do what I could never do on my own. He's sent to help me become more like Jesus. He's a person who knows the ins and the outs of my life. And the Holy Spirit is a person with a mind who interacts with my mind, his thoughts and my thoughts. And, and he interacts with the mind of the Father uh, about me. And so there is this connection with God the Father through this Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a person who has a will, who desires 
He has desires for me, who, who knows the plans that God the Father has for me. And he's got a will that can be pleased and that can be grieved. Jesus gives us that snap, snapshot of the Holy Spirit. He, he gives us another snapshot of the Holy Spirit in this upper room when he says that the Holy Spirit loves to magnify Jesus Christ. He loves to magnify me. In John chapter 15, uh, Jesus says, He, that is the Holy Spirit, will bear witness of me. It's almost as if the Holy Spirit has captured everything that Jesus did in his earthly life, everything that he is doing now uh, as he sits at the right hand of Father. He's captured all that on kind of a celestial, spiritual video, and he's working just to stream that into your heart and into to your mind and into my heart and my mind. Satan is working overtime to distort who Jesus is and what he's done, but the Holy Spirit works to correct Satan's lies with the truth. He, he seeks to magnify who Jesus Christ actually is. And then uh, at the Lord's Supper, in this upper room, in this guest room, Jesus, you know, he's flipping through uh, the, the photo album of the Holy Spirit, and he gives us another picture of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16 when he says that the, the Holy Spirit longs to keep me on the right path. In verse 7 he says, But I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus is saying, speaks through the internal whisper of, of our conscience. And he's telling us, this is right, this is wrong. And sometimes that whisper, that, that conviction, it will occur as we're reading the Scripture. Other times it will be when we are in prayer. Other times it will be when the Holy Spirit just uses the words of another person. And when this occurs, you can almost feel the, the, the stirring of the wings of the Holy Spirit when you're in a situation where you need to make a choice and He's seeking to guide you in the direction of truth and of righteousness. The Holy Spirit, we said last week, is just hovering over our chaos and He refuses to let us believe that the latest hookup or paycheck or gizmo, be it a house or a car or clothing or electronics, that, that, that any magical number that, that we see on the scale, that any magical number that comes back from the lab or that we have in the bank, that any of that is going to be the source of our ultimate joy and identity. The Spirit is saying that's not the right path. No, He bears witness to the truth that you and I, we were made for something much more than any of these. He will convict the world, and we are a part of that world, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And one final snapshot from Jesus that he uses in this upper room concerning the Holy Spirit, and I'm indebted to uh, Pastor Tim Keller from New York uh, for these insights that the Holy Spirit is my advocate. In John 14, 16, Jesus says this, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate, that He may be with you forever. The advocate that Jesus is talking about is the Holy Spirit. And this word advocate is a, a very complex and a nuanced kind of a word in the Greek. Uh, it's the word parakletos, which can be translated advocate or comforter or legal representative or helper. Literally, the word means someone called alongside to help. And that's especially if you're in a legal bind. I mean, you want someone to stand beside you who knows what they're doing if you are in a court of law. Now, if you notice carefully, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, he called him another advocate. I will ask the Father and He will give you another advocate. That's because the Holy Spirit is actually our second advocate. In John's first letter, second chapter, he says this, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. John is describing Jesus as the advocate, as the parakletos. And the reason we need Jesus to be our advocate with the Father in heaven is because of sin. Paul says in Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the truth is we're all moral failures. We have all fallen short. We are all sinners. We're all ultimately self-centered and we do not love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's just our nature to be self-centered. I mean, who has to actually teach a two-year-old to be self-centered? Say, okay, Johnny, come here. Now, I want to make sure that when you get that toy, that you need to know that nobody else uh, should have that toy. And so if anybody wants to grab it from you, you need to say no. Does anyone need to teach their two-year-old to do that? No. Because we are by nature very self-centered. And sometimes that self-centeredness, it just kind of ambushes us. It appears out of nowhere. It might be in road rage. It might be just some unkind words that you spoke that you thought, where did that come from? It's because we're all sinners. And sin has consequences. And the consequences of sin is that we will all be required to appear before God's uh, bar of justice. In Acts chapter 17, it says this, that God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all by raising him from the dead. Deep within your soul and mine, we're, we're haunted with the suspicion that that's true, that one day in glory, we will stand before God to give answer to the life that we've lived. And if we quiet ourselves long enough, we know that's going to happen. If we stop numbing ourselves long enough, we know that's going to happen. If we stop distracting ourselves, we know that's going to happen. And we hope and we imagine that if we put all of our good works on one side of the scales in this, this celestial scale, you know, that they would tip on but only to discover that when we put all of our good works on one side of the scale, it doesn't even budge. So legally, at the eternal bar of justice, we are in eternal trouble. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And so I stand spiritually and eternally accused. And so John tells us that when we sin, we need an advocate with the Father, and we have one, Jesus Christ the righteous. If you're accused of a crime, if you have to go to court, you're going to want the best attorney you can find, the best legal counsel, legal advocate, someone to represent you to plead your case before the jury and the judge. And that verse that I just read says that that's exactly who Jesus is. And it's exactly what he does for us. That he appears on our behalf, standing at the bar of justice, and he is pleading. And here's what I envision happening in that celestial courtroom. Jesus has sat down with me pre-trial. And he's looking over everything and he goes, oh, you don't have much of a case here. <laughs> You are as guilty as sin. Oh, I'm sorry. You're as guilty as can be. Good thing for you that the judge is my dad. I'm going to plead mercy for you on this one. I'll say, Dad, could you cut Bob a break here? You know, give him another chance. If that's Jesus' strategy as my advocate, I'd worry about the judge's patience because we're going to be in front of the judge again and again and again. But that's actually not what happens. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and Jesus, our advocate, is not pleading for mercy. Jesus, our advocate, is demanding justice. Before the heavenly bar of eternal justice, he is making a case for my acquittal. And he's saying, Father, you are just, 
Bob's sins have consequences and they must be paid for. Sin requires death, but there has been a death. Father, I've made payment for all of Bob's sins. My broken body, my shed blood. I'm not asking for mercy. I'm demanding an acquittal for him. Because it would be unjust to demand two payments for the same offense. There can only be no condemnation based on the law. I demand justice here. I've already paid for the, that man's sins. Because of Jesus' sacrifice and his advocacy, I can stand acquitted before God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so my first advocate speaks to God the Father on my behalf. That is Jesus. But I've got a second advocate that he tells me about. My second advocate, the Holy Spirit, speaks to me on my behalf. I not only need an advocate to speak with me in the court of heaven, I need an advocate to speak to me here in the court of my own heart. I need an advocate to deal with the adversities in my own heart, the self-accusation, the fears, the guilt, the temptations, the doubt. And Jesus said, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, he will bear witness of me. He's not only going to remind you of what I've done on earth, he's going to tell you what I'm doing for you in heaven right now, interceding as your advocate to the Father. And Jesus is pleading and prodding and he's entreating in heaven. And the Holy Spirit is pleading and prodding and treating, entreating my heart to get it fully convinced of what Jesus is currently doing and what he has done, suffering and dying for my sins and what he's doing on my behalf now, saying, Father, look at these scars. They are, are for Bob and for anyone who will claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, the Spirit's job is to make our heavenly advocate so beautiful that it's going to alter me. Remember what I said earlier, that the Holy Spirit loves to magnify Jesus Christ? Well, it's really true. My heart has a difficult time believing that Jesus has actually taken care of my sin and is pleading with me in heaven. Uh, in whatever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts, John will tell us in his first letter. And Paul, in his letter to the Romans, says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So my doubt-filled heart has the Holy Spirit testifying with crushing, irrefutable testimony that in Jesus... I am forgiven and that I am empowered to live for Him. So God forbid that I should ever treat the Holy Spirit like some guest in my life. My heart needs Him to be a permanent resident with access to every area of my life, inside and out. And I pray that you would pray with me right now to give the Holy Spirit that kind of status. Let's pray. Jesus, we are asking that your Holy Spirit would come in a, in a way that uh, is not just simply temporary uh, as a guest, but is permanent as a resident of this heart because we need the continual affirmation of the Holy Spirit of what you've done and what you are doing, Jesus. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would convince us of righteousness, uh, of sin, of judgment, but to know that all of these have been taken care of because of what you've done for us, Jesus. So we pray that this Holy Spirit might be a constant companion, an advocate, a comforter to us in this day and forevermore in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Virgin.